In finite group theory, the class equation plays a remarkably powerful role. Um, let's just quickly recall what it says. So it says that if I have a finite group G, um, I can consider its center. Um, and what I find is that um, the number of elements in the group is the same as the number of elements in the center plus the sum of a bunch of indices of centralizers of particular elements in the group. So I can write the order of the group um, in particular as the order of the center plus a bunch of non-trivial indices of subgroups. Okay, uh, where does this come from? Very briefly, um, it comes from the fact that I can consider G acting on itself by conjugation. Um, we call the equivalence classes and or, or orbits under this action the conjugacy classes, right? So, um, so H is conjugate to K is the same as saying that um, GHG inverse is K for some G. And these uh, sets of uh, conjugacy classes uh, form the orbits under this action. So uh, what do we know? Well, if you have, if you consider this action, then you can break up the group as a disjoint union of orbits, right? G is a union of orbits, disjoint union, and I can choose some representatives uh, from each orbit. So let me choose them like this. I'll choose um, Z1 through ZS uh, and uh, G1 through GM are going to be uh, some distinct um, representatives, uh, one from each orbit. Um, I'm going to choose these notationally so that the size of the orbit of Zi are going to be one. Some of these things only have one thing in their orbit. And the size of the orbit of um, the various Gi's uh, is going to be strictly bigger than one. So, you know, some orbits are bigger than one and some aren't. Now, of course, if the orbit of something is one, that means that whenever you conjugate, you do nothing. Uh, so, in other words, for the z's, you know that uh, uh, g, uh, zi, g inverse is zi for all, for all these g's, which is to say that, um, that zi commutes with everything in the group. Um, so, in fact, um, this description tells us that, uh, that Z of G, in this case, is Z1 through ZS. And, of course, these other ones are, you know, have bigger orbits. So, let's now just uh, record what that says. Uh, oh, I guess, well, there's one other thing to say, which is, how big are these other orbits? Well, the size of the orbit of one of these other guys um, can be calculated with the orbit stabilizer theorem. It's the order of the group divided by the order of the stabilizer, or in other words, the index in the group of the stabilizer of GI with respect to the conjugation action. Well, again, what does it mean that, um, that a group element stabilizes GI? Um, it means that um, G, GI, G inverse is GI which is to say that, um, that G and GI commute. So the stabilizer is actually um, the centralizer. Okay, and then if you put this together, you exactly get the class equation. It says that what are all the things in the group? Well, you have, um, they're either the things in the, in the single orbits, so you get all these Zs, and you get the orbits of the various GIs. And the size of those orbits is exactly this. Okay, and that's the class equation. So now that we have that, let's see some of the remarkable things that you can do with it. All right, so the first fun thing you can do with the class equation is prove uh, Cauchy's theorem. So we're going to start with that. What is Cauchy's theorem? Well, if you remember, there's this uh, beautiful thing called Lagrange's theorem that says that um, whenever you have a subgroup of a group, uh, finite group, the order of the group divides the order, sorry, the order of the subgroup divides the order of the group. And of course, the converse is kind of famously not true. You might have something, some number dividing the order of the group, but not have any subgroups of that size. On the other 
hand, Cauchy's theorem gives you a kind of a weaker um, converse of this. Cauchy's theorem says that if um, P is prime, and P divides the order of a group, finite group, then there does exist a subgroup um, whose order is that prime. Okay, so let's just quickly um, see how we can do this with the class equation. So, proof. Well, um, let's recall the class equation. The order of the group is the order of the center um, plus the sum i equals 1 to m of uh, uh, the sum of the indices of these centralizers of some particular elements in the group. Um, and uh, what are we going to do? Actually, I should say, the proof is going to work by, um, by induction on the order of the group. Okay, so we'll induct on the order of the group. So um, let's consider two cases. Um, case one, um, P divides uh, the order of the center. So if P divides the order of the center, then um, it suffices to show that, um, that the center has a subgroup of order P. So we can um, pick any um, G in the center, the you know, center is non-trivial, so pick anything in the center. And well, either um, you know P divides the order of G or not. If um, if P divides the order of G, so let's say if so, I don't know. For example, that says that um, the order of G, let's say the order of G is R P for some R. Well, then um, that says that the order of uh, G to the R um, is exactly P. And so, boom, we're done. We have an element of order uh, P, a subgroup of order P, therefore. Okay. Um, if if um, P uh, doesn't divide uh, the order of G, well, then what can we do? Well, we know that, um, that therefore, um, uh, you know, well, you know that if you look at the subgroup generated by G, this is um, in the center by assumption, and therefore it's normal, right? Uh, you conjugate anything in the center and you, you're doing nothing. So this is a normal subgroup. And so I can consider the group uh, G mod, uh, the cyclic subgroup generated by G. By, that's a group of smaller order, and by induction, I can find some, I don't know, H inside of here, uh, where the order of H uh, is P. But now, if I look at um, any lift of that element back to G, right, if I, um, if I um, let's call this element H bar inside of G mod G, if I choose um, some H and G where, um, uh, where H, that cosine is H bar, any lift of that, then you can see that if you take um, that, that the order of H um, has to uh, be divisible by P. Right? If, you, if you raise it to some power prime to P, it's not trivial in the quotient, so it couldn't be trivial. So therefore, um, right, let me skip over here. Therefore, P divides the order of H, and just like before, we're done. By taking some multiple of H, we have an element of order P. Okay, so that was case one. If P divides the center of the group, then, um, then we can finish it this way. Therefore, uh, we can assume that P doesn't divide the center of the group. And let's look at that. doesn't divide the order of the center. If P doesn't divide the order of the center, then P is going to also have to not divide one of these things, right? Because if P divides all of these, but not that, then P doesn't divide the order of the group, right? 
So like divisible IP, not, not divisible by P, it can't be divisible by P. So, um, so in this case, we must have that P divides, um, sorry, doesn't divide one of these guys. Okay, well, what does that mean? Um, that means that, um, I mean, what the, um, that means that, um, you know, P divides the order of the group, and you know that once you divide, you know, this is the order of G divided by the order of the centralizer, right? So P divides the order of the group, but once you divide the order of the group by the order of the centralizer, P no longer divides it. That tells you that P had to divide the order of the centralizer. Okay? But, of course, the centralizer is smaller than the whole group because, by assumption, you know, none of these GIs was central, so the centralizers are all, um, you know, not the whole group, right, or else it would have been over there. So, um, so this is a, a strictly smaller group. So by induction, um, there exists um, a subgroup of order P in um, CGGI, but then therefore there is something in the whole group. And we're done. Okay, that is Cauchy's theorem. One cute fact that you get from uh, the class equation is um, about p groups, right? So, um, so suppose um, p is a prime number, and I have a finite group whose order is p to the n for some n. So this is called a p group. The class equation tells us that the number of things in the group is the number of things in the center plus the sum of some indices of some um, conjugacy classes, where, um, where these are, you know, where C, these are some proper subgroups of G, right? right? The assumption was that these GIs are not central, uh, therefore the centralizer is not the whole group, therefore these are some proper subgroups of the group. In particular, um, these indices, if you have a P group, are all divisible by P, right? Um, so, right, in fact, they're, you know, P powers or whatever, right? Because, so, um, so P, therefore, divides CGUGI uh, for all P, for all I. And, well, what does that say? That says that, um, that P also has to divide this, right? I mean, if all these are divisible by P and this is divisible by P, this one must be as well. That means P divides the order of the center. And in particular, that says the center is non-trivial. So this is a wonderful fact about P groups. P groups always have non-trivial centers. In particular, they have non-trivial normal subgroups, um, in fact, characteristic. And, you know, and so therefore, you can take apart, in some sense, P groups in terms of these um, simpler groups by, by taking quotients. Uh, in particular, I'll just make the, the quick comment um, that um, you can, it's a, it's a nice exercise to check, so it can show, as an aside, that um, you know if G uh, is some you know finite group, and if um, G mod the center of G is abelian, uh, sorry, is cyclic, then that implies G is abelian. Right, so this is a, a nice exercise to do. You can do it very explicitly, Just basically by picking a couple elements and moving them around. Um, so um, if, you, if you see this fact, then it follows, for example, that if the order of the group is the square of a prime, well, what do you know? You know that, this, that is, because it's a P group, it has a non-trivial center. The center, therefore, um, is either order P or order P squared. If, um, if the center is order P, then you know that uh, G mod the center of G, well, 
uh, size p, and therefore it's cyclic, and therefore this is, um, uh, so this is cyclic, but therefore g is abelian. Of course, the, you know, it's kind of a contradiction because we assume the center was only p. Therefore, the center is everything, therefore you're abelian. It's kind of a twisty way of saying things. But in any ways, if g has order p squared, the implication, therefore, is that g is abelian. Okay, so, you know, uh, fun with the class equation. 